A few weeks ago, we interviewed Mark Sargent. He's a flat earther. We actually learned a lot from Mark. And we think what we learned from Mark has big implications for science communication. So let's talk about it. You think for the longest time that you live here. But what if it wasn't this? It is not a globe. This, this is what it is. Let's talk about where this all comes from. Humans like learning new things. Whether it be discovering something for the first time, finding a flaw in our current knowledge that goes against common perceptions, we all seek the truth. Scientists, entrepreneurs, even conspiracy theorists, we're all driven by that same feeling. However, while we can say maybe that the feeling that motivates a scientist and conspiracy theorist might be the same, the approaches they take are not on the same footing. It becomes problematic when you approach a problem with a certain hypothesis in mind, cherry pick evidence that supports that hypothesis, look for easy explanations to explain why that evidence exists in the first place, and lack the critical thinking skills to evaluate the shortcomings of your methodology. If this is done, you may end up constructing a false reality. Though we all seek the truth, the most reliable way to get there is through scientific inquiry, because ultimately, we want to have the correct answers, don't we? The textbook answer takes too long. Well, the masses are a huge, huge group, mm -hmm. and they want something that's easy to understand. These easier answers seem to make more sense. Now, they went against paradigm of science in that regard, but I was like, still makes more sense. I don't, I don't care. Remember, the general public, whether you agree with it or not, they like easy. They always have. We understand that if you're someone who has not had the opportunity to get a formal education or spend years studying a subject and have questions about the natural world, that science is daunting. It's appealing when someone presents you with a seemingly easy and accurate answer to questions that you may have. But it becomes problematic when these easy answers come from bogus theories and you don't have the tools to distinguish what's wrong with them. Let us be clear. The onus here is not on the individual being lied to, but on the person feeding them false claims. Whether they believe in the views they are spreading or not, Without a doubt, they are the ones at fault. What was disappointing to me about our conversation with Mark was that he was wrong so many times about basic high school level physics. And regardless of Mark's true intentions, he is using incorrect physical arguments to create contradictions in science that seem to align with one's everyday experience. Take a listen. When we're swimming, our arms push against what? Water. When we're walking, our feet push against the ground. When a plane is in the air, it pushes against the air because what we're breathing in here is just this soup. When you're in a vacuum, what's it pushing off of? It, it's not it's pushing momentum. off of anything. What it's doing to, is it's propelling. To. No, no, it doesn't have to. The has thing is, to. no, it doesn't have to because what it's doing is it's burning fuel the fuel is being shot out one direction, and by Newton's third law, you then get propelled in the other direction because equal and opposite force. To the average person that only has their daily experience to work off of, his arguments seem plausible. But in reality, you only need a basic physics understanding to be able to explain the things that he claims are inexplicable. It is irresponsible to use your platform to promote false and unsupported claims, especially when you know your audience does not have the ability to distinguish between what is true and false. Knowing basic physics, biology, and chemistry can help you form clear judgments, making you less susceptible to being tricked and lied to. And having this basic understanding also helps you see why the universe is so complex. Things don't always have an easy answer, and that is okay. Because the things that are often worth understanding are also the things that are inherently difficult to understand. The third crucial factor that leads people to deny science is that we love being right. 
Being wrong is embarrassing and that can feed into our ego. It becomes extremely dangerous when that clouds your objective reasoning. Imagine being so convinced that you are right that you choose to ignore and reject clear evidence against your theory simply out of the fear of embarrassment. And the bigger the ego of the individual, the bigger at risk they are of engaging in such a behavior. Even Mark himself recognizes this behavior, although he only sees it in us, not himself. Take a listen. You are so invested financially, the time spent, not even emotionally, but you're so invested in it that the paradigm shift would be too much even if you wanted to. Again, this is this is cognitive dissonance right here. You don't, here's the difference. You don't want to believe it and I don't blame you. I don't. To combat this behavior, we have to embrace being wrong. Failure is a good thing because it allows you to learn. I would much rather be ignorant for a brief moment rather than ignorant my entire life. And when you do science, this is drilled into you. Not only are you constantly surrounded by people who are smarter than you, but you often have to fail countless times before you succeed. The fact that scientists face challenges on a daily basis results in people who are, in our experience, very humble. And while there can be scientists and non-scientists alike who exhibit egotistical traits, at least there are basic practices in science that limit this from happening. These include peer-reviewed journals, feedback from scientists at colloquia and presentations, committees, etc. Without these checks in place, an ego can run wild, and that is often what we see with leaders of conspiracy theories. When your desire to be right supersedes your desire to know the truth, you end up cherry-picking evidence that supports your view, and then actively discrediting data and expert opinions that do not support your view. We must not let the ego cloud our judgment. Otherwise, we'll never get to the truth. Science is wrong a lot on a, on a lot of things, but they never apologize for it. They just restate things. Yeah, science, science is not incorruptible. And I know it's just the nature of it. Again, if you're wrong about something, there's no apologies. It's just that, oh, no, 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 we're just reclassifying it. Science is absolutely wrong, a lot, but it's supposed to be, that's the point. It's a self-correcting process that is supposed to find flaws with itself in order to progress. While there are many views on the practice of science, many scientists today operate under a falsificationist point of view, which means that you can never prove something right, or almost never. But what you try to do with an experiment is you actually try to prove something wrong, if you think of it this way, you can get a result 99 times, but you can never be sure you'll still get that result on the 100th time. Instead, what experiments try to do are to prove something false. And if you don't, you hold on to your theory with the understanding that it's your best model, but that it's probably not absolutely true. The way this works in practice is you start with a theory, and from that you develop a falsifiable hypothesis. You then acquire your data, and if your data does not support your hypothesis, you throw out your old theory, working with your data to develop a new framework which can explain the things that you see. On the other hand, when a conspiracy theorist finds data that doesn't support their theory, oftentimes they throw out the data or discredit the experiment that got them the data in the first place. It's impossible to make any progress under this system because you never rule anything out. Furthermore, one often finds that the experiments they run are flawed in the first place. Because these experiments are not designed with a falsifiable claim in mind, there are often too many uncontrolled variables that can completely change the result. To someone untrained in the scientific method, this distinction might not be so clear. Take this example. The, the main experiments, the main points that we came up with, anyone can do. And you can do it on the ground. You don't, First off, when you say, oh yeah, you take a radio telescope, it's like, I, I don't have one of those lying around here, and neither do any of my friends, a radio telescope. But what we do have are our HD cameras. The point is, the sun doesn't set. It just fades off in the distance. If you had a filter and zoomed in with your cameras, in fact, we can pop the sun back up. You can watch the sun set, you crank up the zoom, it pops back up. You crank it up, it pops up again. And then eventually, it just fades away into the soup that we're living in right now. 
This seems like a straightforward experiment. However, because of the preconceived conclusion of mind, not enough care is taken in the design of the experiment. In this case, it's clear that there should have been a filter on the camera. Without it, the sun is completely oversaturated, making even a portion of the sun peeking over the horizon appear like a sphere when it clearly is not. An ideal experiment has every external variable counted for, such that you're only testing one thing at a time. These experiments are flawed, but honestly that's expected. We aren't born with some innate ability to conduct well-designed experiments. That's a skill that is learned, and it takes time and effort, but anyone can learn to do it. Anyone can learn to be a good scientist. Given that developing the skills to become a scientist takes hard work, dedication, and a heck of a lot of time, it's not surprising that a common sentiment about science is that it is reserved for a small subset of people who are genius enough to do the work. Unfortunately, it's that mindset that makes it so easy to write off science as just a hobby for nerds. When scientists become movie stereotypes, rather than people, it's easy to think that they don't have the best interests of the public at heart. The truth is, we're not special. We started off as regular kids, and just like anyone who decides to be a teacher, businessman, firefighter, we decided to do science. And we still are regular people. We just study the universe and now want to share that knowledge with you. Becoming a scientist takes a lot of hard work, but anyone can do it. Despite the stereotypes, the single most important trait a scientist can have is dedication, just like any other job. That being said, there is one point with which we wholeheartedly agree with Mark, and that is that science needs to be communicated to more people, more often, and more clearly. Let's be honest, academia in general is not accessible, but science has the added hindrance that it requires you to learn very technical skills, conduct time-consuming and expensive experiments, and often you don't get paid a lot to do it. These factors severely limit who gets to do science and who doesn't. And this absolutely bothers us, and this is something that we desperately want to change. One of our goals with this channel is to introduce more people to higher level science in a fun and entertaining way. It's hard to understand what it is that we do when science isn't accurately portrayed to the general public. So if you've ever been interested in what it's like to be just a real, everyday scientist, this channel is where you'll find it. Going into this interview, our goal was to better understand anti-science sentiments in society. Now Flat Earth, of course, is an extreme example. But for that reason, it serves as a perfect test case to understand the milder, more socially accepted forms of science denial. Anti-vaxxers, climate change deniers, people who think that 5G radiation or GMO foods are bad for you. These are all views shared by non-negligible portions of the population, and their blatant rejection of science has direct impacts on your life. We learned a lot from our conversation with Mark. We learned that we need to be more mindful about how we seek answers. We need to be open to the possibility of being wrong. We need to be careful not to fall into traps. And most importantly, we need to be more transparent in our science communication. We'll end this with one final thought. A common reason why a lot of people choose to believe in Flat Earth is because the vastness of the universe and the incredible time and length scales involved seem to remind us of how insignificant we are. It's comforting to think that you are not an accident, that you are here for a reason, that this world was made for you. But why limit yourself to this tiny piece of earth that you see around you? Open yourself up to science and you will discover a world full of mystery and full of wonder. And the best part, is that it's yours to discover.